We are going to um, continue our study in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, so if you've got your Bibles and want to open up to there, that's where we'll be at. Last week it was a rich study, talked a little bit about work, and a lot of people, Bear pointed out, they get their identity from their work. Um, that's usually the first question out of people's mouths is, what is it that you do? Usually the second question that comes out of their mouth is, what do you do when you're not at work? What do you do with your free time? What books do you like to read? What music do you like to listen to? And you can tell a lot about a person by what it is they do with their Saturday mornings. So our text for today is going to look at a poem, a song, I think, uh, that was back uh, it was popular back in Solomon's time, uh, something that a guy would have read back then, and it would tell us a lot about that guy. So let's look at that, and I'll open up by reading it, uh, just chapter 3. We'll go from uh, verse 1 down to verse 15. Uh, Solomon says there, There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing, a time to search and a time to give up as lost, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear apart, and a time to sew together, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. What profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? I have seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart. Yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor, it is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it, and there is nothing to take from it. For God is so worked that men should fear him. That which is has been already, and that which will be has already been. For God seeks what has passed by. Rich text, a lot to that song. A lot more than I'll be able to express or tell you about today, but we'll look at the surface, I guess, a little bit. A while back, there was a movie, it was called The Dead Poet Society. Many of you guys probably know that movie. And uh, there's a scene in that movie where Robin Williams, he's the eccentric teacher, he kneels down amongst the desks of his students and... um, gives them this line, and it struck me when I saw the movie 20, 30 years ago. Recently, the iPad Air has put out a commercial with these words, so they may be familiar to you, but they're from Walt Whitman, and they go like this. O me, O life of the questions of these recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish, what good amid these, O me, O life? Answer, that you are here, that life exists in identity, that the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse, that the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. What will your verse be? Earlier he had said, you know, we don't write, man, poetry because it's cute. We read and we write poetry because... We are members of the human race, and the human race is filled with passion. And medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, 
beauty, romance, love, these are what we stay alive for. What will your verse be is what Whitman says. The world exhorts us to say something, to contribute a verse. But I, need, I guess we need to ask ourselves, I mean, do we really got something to say? Perhaps the question is not, what will your verse be? But rather, when you look at the creation, the vast immensity of the, of the creation, incomprehensibleness of it, the vastness of it, is it worth my time in the midst of that to, to even say something, to contribute a verse? The poet Walt Whitman is correct in pointing out that man is talking a lot, and he's saying it with passion. But why does man have that passion anyway? Why does he so desperately feel like he needs to contribute a verse? Man has no answer for that. The best he can do is point out life exists, identity. The powerful play goes on and you can contribute a verse. Solomon, on the other hand, he has real answers to why man is so passionate. Answers as to why man is so incurably religious. If you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, he tells us, he says, He, being God, has also set eternity in their heart. Man, indeed, is incurably a religious being. The poet Walt Whitman observed this. Even atheists observed that. Men like Sigmund Freud. So, people go to Sigmund Freud, and they ask him, why is this? Why, when we look at these natives, when we look at these peoples, um, different cultures, why is it they're so religious? Seeking something spiritual. What's the deal with that? And his answer was interesting. He essentially said something like this. It was, well, man, he lives in this world, and he sees that it is a dangerous place, that it's not safe to be in this world. I mean, a tornado comes, levels a city, and it does not care who it kills. Children, adults, doesn't give a rip. Very impersonal. A tsunami comes. 2,000 people sitting on the beach of Thailand, gone. Like that. And it don't care. And Freud said, man looks at that, and he can't live with that. He can't handle it. He has to think, there's something I can do about that. There's some kind of control that I can exert over that. So what does man do? Freud says, he makes up gods. He creates gods. The god of the tornado, say. The god of the sea, the tsunami. Because now helpless man can turn to those gods and appeal to them, and maybe they'll relent. Maybe they'll back off us. And that was his take on why man is so religious. And that's fair. But my reply to that is, when you look at the God of the Bible, he ain't a God that man would make up. If God was going to make up a man, or a, 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 if, God was gonna make, if man was going to make up a God, it wouldn't be a holy one. It wouldn't be one that controls everything, it'd be one that man could control. It wouldn't be the God that we just read about, the one that exists outside of time, that is eternal. That isn't the kind of God a man would make up. A wrathful God, for example, that pours out his wrath on sin, that's holy, pure, spotless. Man wouldn't make up a God like that. That would be my re response to Freud. He exists outside of time. 
He indeed is in, in eternity. In fact, he's their creator. He created time. He created man. And he, cre he created man, our text says, with that eternity in their heart. Daniel J. Estes says, humans, they're bound by time. But they are wired for eternity. And that's the truth. They intuitively know, he says, that there must be meaning somewhere and that they were made for more than vain toil. And so Solomon, he tells us why man's incurably religious. Because God has set eternity in their heart, verse 11. And so the question is, will anything under heaven, verse 1, fill that heart? Medicine, law, business, engineering, these sustain life. But indeed, it is the poet, the musician, who tries to help us understand what it is we stay alive for. Give me the making of the songs of a nation, said 18th century Scottish political thinker Andrew Fletcher. And I don't care who writes its laws. It's the poets, the musicians. They tell us what we really think. And I wonder, do you listen today to the words? Do you listen to the words of the songs of our times? In a word, they're sad. They are depressing. Dust in the wind. All we are is dust in the wind. Same old song. Just a drop of water in an endless sea. All we do crumbles to the ground, yet we refuse to see that we're dust in the wind. That's all we are. A heart that resonates to that, that's sad. The number one hit in 1965 was a song by the Birds. I ain't old enough to know about that, but some of you guys are. It was called Turn, Turn, Turn. And it was based on the words of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Like a man on a treadmill, that's what it reminds me of. Going nowhere, exerting a ton of energy trying to get there. It's just another song expressing vanity, the emptiness that man feels because he just can't find anything under heaven that will fill that gap in his heart, that eternity that Solomon tells us about. The musician's song, the poet's poem, they reflect like a mirror what really is going on in our chest. When we see the music that our kids are drawn to, when we see the movies today that, that people think are entertainment, what you're seeing is empty hearts striving after wind, striving after something that will fill that gap and it just never does. It's a confused desire to fill a heart created for eternity with things that just ain't going to satisfy it. Our hearts desire, and we don't know it, they desire God. They desire spiritual food. They desire the Word of God. And we are learning by painful experience through this painful life that you don't meet a spiritual need with something. You just don't. They aren't proportionable. They aren't designed for that. Burroughs, I told you I, I like to read him. He wrote a book called um, Divine Contentment. It was a book on contentment. And he likened it to this. He said, you might as well take a man that's starving, that hadn't had no food, and put him out there on the street with the wind blowing and just have him open up his mouth like this and fill it with wind and expect that that would fill his empty stomach like food would. That ain't going to work because wind was never designed 
to fill an empty belly. It just wasn't. And it's the same with the creation. No material thing, nothing was ever designed to fill your empty heart. There's just one that can do that. His name is Jesus Christ. He alone can fill your empty heart. So I look at our culture. I look at the trash they flock to, the words that are in these songs, the movies that they think are entertaining. And you just got to weep, almost. Yeah, that's a time to weep, according to Solomon. That's a time to get sad. Because they are starving, and they just don't know it. God alone can satisfy that. So the birds, their song, number one, 1965, turn, turn, turn. We feel that vanity, that vanity of life. And everything, at least in my being, screams, where do I get off this treadmill? Why am I doing this? Why am I busting my behind doing this? Where do I get off? This is going nowhere. And I hear kids at the school I work at say that all the time. Why am I doing this homework? Why do I have to do this? And it just doesn't fill the heart. Knowledge doesn't fill the heart. None of it. No created thing. You don't have a reason to be here until you know Jesus Christ. That's kind of how it is. So the song expresses that. It expresses it in our time. And that's what it meant in Solomon's time. That's what it expressed in his day as well. So turn your attention with me to that song. Let's look at those words. God's poem, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3. There is an appointed time for everything. And there is a time for every event under heaven. Literally, For everything, an appointed time, a time for everything. It's called a chiasm. Verse 1 forms a chiasm. I am no English student, so I had no clue what a chiasm is, so thank God for Google. So I just Googled it to see what it is. And essentially, to make a long story short, it is a statement that's emphasis is right in the middle. So in the English language, the emphasis would be at the beginning or at the end. Apparently in the Hebrew language, the emphasis would be in the middle. So you have here a statement that says, for everything, an appointed time, a time for everything. And the thing that's in the middle is appointed time. That's the emphasis. Time is appointed. Nothing is random under heaven. A sovereign God absolutely controls everything. There is not one rebel molecule in all the universe. A sovereign God controls everything. And if you look at the range of this God's control, that sets me back. It goes from birth to death. It goes over buildings, inanimate things, things that don't think. It goes over people and their hearts and their emotions, weeping, crying. God reigns sovereign over that, all of it. From one extreme that you can think of to the other, all of it is underneath his sovereign reign. As the poem unfolds, it reveals a more detailed chiastic structure and if you go study the poem you'll see that it's got remarkable symmetry it's beautiful in its rhythm it's beautiful in its flow and it's beautifully designed a beautiful poem however as beautiful as that poem is it is troubling it is disturbing to begin with We're told 
that you don't control anything. I don't control anything. God controls everything. And if you're a control freak like me, you, you struggle with that. You have a hard time with that. God is in control of everything. You're not. But look at the poem. It isn't just good things that God reigns over, love, kindness, tenderness. It's bad things that God reigns over. Death, destruction, war. People have a hard time with that. That's why I say, if, if you were Freud, you make a God that's loving. You make a God that's tender all the time. You don't make a God that's holy. You don't make a God that makes war. You don't make the God of the Bible up. You just don't. So he reigns over good things. He reigns over bad things. This same God, someone has once said, that created the butterfly, he created the shark. That's the God of the Bible. Furthermore, as the poem unfolds, you will see it reveals 14 good things and 14 bad things. And Solomon asks the question back in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 3, what advantage does man have in all this work which he does under the sun? And you'll recall the key word in that text was advantage, which comes from the original Hebrew, Hebrew word meaning that which is left over when the transaction is done. When it's all said and done, and we tally up the plus column, and we tally up the minus column, what do I got left? Well, let me tell you what you got left. 14 minus 14 is that. You got zip. Nothing to show for it, unless you know Jesus Christ. So, that's the point of the question in verse 9. What profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? Or as Whitman would say, what will your verse be? The answer from the poem is not, you can contribute a verse. Isn't that nice? You can squeak your little voice in this vast universe and maybe somebody might hear it. That's not Solomon's answer, no. The message of the song basically is, is just don't say nothing. You don't have anything to say. And when I consider that, I think about Romans chapter 1 to 3, where Paul, like just an unmerciful persecutor, just, just indicts all mankind. There's no one righteous. And then just because somebody might stand up and think, but I am. No, not one. You aren't righteous either. And he sums it up by saying, the prosecution, their case is airtight. So airtight that the defense won't speak. It's, it's, don't talk. You have absolutely nothing to say. You are convicted. You were born convicted. You were born destined for hell. You don't have nothing to say. The case is open and shut. That's what I think of. And Solomon's right. Mankind has no excuse. They have nothing to say to a holy God. Nothing. Unless they get a good lawyer. And I happen to know one. His name is Jesus Christ. You need him to talk for you. Good lawyer, when their client's in trouble, he'll tell him to shut up. Shut your trap. I'll start talking for you. And if we got any sense, that's what we'll do. We will close our trap, and we will let Jesus Christ talk to the Holy Father for us. That's what the Bible says. So I think of Romans 1 to 3. I think about the fact that I'm on a treadmill, that if I don't come to salvation, if I'm not born again, that I have nothing to contribute. 14 minus 14, it's zip, any way you look at it. And isn't that just like God? 
to tell us the truth while there's time to just lay it out and say, here's the ragged edge reality of it, people. You better come to Christ in time. That's the only thing time's good for, come to salvation. Jesus put it this way. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do zip. That's what it adds up to. Luther, as he said to Erasmus, zip is not a little something. What he actually said is, nothing, my friend Erasmus, that doesn't mean a little something. You got nothing to bring to the table. Nothing. You're going to come naked with nothing. And you're going to stand before a holy God and you better be clothed when that happens in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So the poets, the musicians, they rightly reflect the poverty that exists in our spirits without this God. We have abandoned God, if you want to know the truth. We have told God, we don't need you. Romans 1, verses 18 to 32. We've told God, don't need you. I can take care of myself, thank you. And you know what God has done? Have at it. Go ahead. Be your own God. Let's see how it turns out for you in the end. And that's what's happening with the suffering and the pain. We want to be our own God. We want to call our own shots. And God has said, go ahead. Let's see how it turns out for you. And the artists, they just scream back to us what our hearts look like. Try these words. Cat's foot, iron claw, neurosurgeons scream for more from paranoia's poison door. 21st century schizoid man. That sells, if you believe it. What that tells me is there's a bunch of kids out there that that appeals to. The guy that's screaming the schizoid man song, they say, I, he gets me. He identifies with me. He, he's telling me my heart. I'll buy his stuff. And that sells. Why? Because Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 32, is just like God said it is. You want to run your own life? That's what happens. You don't want to submit to my authority? You don't want to bow to my wisdom? You don't want to bow to the word of God? That's what you get, kids, that identify with that. Now, is that not sad? That's sad. Man wants to be his own God. He wants to control everything. And he's finding out by painful experience that that is just a tough job. That is a pretty burdensome task. So, Solomon says in verse 10, I've seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. Man is left to not only theoretically acknowledge his poverty, but the Holy Spirit, God, makes him feel it. And I don't like reading the book of Ecclesiastes, I'll be honest with you, because when I have to read Ecclesiastes, I feel it. It's painful to read that stuff. And I can see why people don't have a clue what the book says and have never read it. Because it cuts you wide open, just like any word of God does. And you feel it. And that's just what Solomon wants you to do. Why? Because God is cruel? No. God makes man, like I told you, feel his poverty in time so that he won't feel it in hell for eternity. Better to feel it now in a low dose than to get that heavy dose that'll never end. And eternity in hell is the same thing as eternity in heaven. They're the same. So if you check out of this life and go into that one under the wrath of God, like Dante said, 
abandon all hope. There's no hope. You're done. So you're going to feel it here in this life. And that is a loving thing. That is a loving thing. Because if you get out of this life without understanding your need for Christ, you got problems. So, man is forced to recognize his bankruptcy. God makes him do it while he's got time. And he alone, the next verse says, makes everything beautiful in his time. Literally, he has made everything beautiful in its time. And that's point, point two on your outline, God's providence. This, people, this is the Old Testament version of Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. What we're talking about here is God's providence. I wonder, what comes to your mind when I throw that word out? Providence. Nothing, absolutely, right? You don't think of nothing. Well, try this. Think of it like a clock, okay? Big clock with a bunch of little gears behind it. And the clock just goes one direction. It all goes one way. But there are a bunch of tiny little gears that steer it that way, okay? Now, you can look at one gear, and you may not like the way that it turns, but it must turn that way. It must go that way, or else this whole clock stops. And that's the way it is with God's providence. That's, again, from Burroughs. That's the way it is with his providence. He says when a child looks at a clock, it looks first at one wheel, then at another wheel. He doesn't look at them all together or the dependence that one has upon another, but the workman has his eyes on them all together, and he sees the dependence of all one upon another. That's the way it is with God's providence. Bad things, good things, all work together towards the one purpose of bringing glory to Jesus Christ. You're never going to get that. I'm never going to get that, but that's just the way it is. To grant great good, he says, after great evil is one thing, and to turn great evil into the greatest good is another. And yet that is God's way. The greatest good that God intends for his people, he many times works out of the greatest evil. The greatest light is brought out of the greatest darkness. I remember, he says, Luther has a striking expression for this. He says, it is the way of God. He humbles that he might exalt. He kills that he might make alive. He confounds that he might glorify. This is the way of God, he says, but everyone does not understand it. This is the art of arts, the science of the sciences, the knowledge of knowledges. To understand this, that God, when he will bring life, brings it out of death. He brings joy out of sorrow. He brings prosperity out of affliction. Yea, and many times brings grace out of sin. That is, makes use of sin to work furtherance of grace. It is the way of God to bring all good out of evil, not only to overcome the evil, but to make the evil work toward the good. Now when the soul comes to understand this, it will take away our murmuring and bring contentment into our spirits. But I fear that there are but few who understand it aright. Perhaps they read of such things. And they hear such things in a sermon, but they are not instructed in this by Jesus Christ. That this is the way of God to bring the greatest good out of the greatest evil. End quote. So, if you've been tracing me, if you have been following my 
line of thought to this point, you got questions bubbling up in your heart. You're saying to yourself, if you're thinking, so, God, absolute control, everything, good things, bad things, how then is he going to hold me responsible for anything, for what I've done, sin? Well, look at verse 11. He has also set eternity in their heart. Yet, so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. We, as finite creatures, we got our limits, don't we? We aren't God. Are you beginning to see that? We are not God. And the Apostle Paul in Romans would tell us, shut your trap. Shut up. Who are you to come before a holy God and ask a question like that? That's what he would say. Solomon is a little bit more gracious. He says, man, he, he can't find it out. He can't find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. You see, people, when a finite creature bound by time, seeks to understand an infinite holy God, his faculties begin to feel it. They begin to be strained. There begins to be tensions. And Solomon says, you're not going to get it. That's not the only issue, by the way, that's in the Bible. I mean, explain to me how God, Jesus, can be 100% man and 100% God. I don't know, but I believe it, because God said it. And the fact that I don't understand it, that doesn't say nothing about God. That says everything about me. My limitations, my bound time view. I'm limited to my own time. I don't see things like he did in the poem. I don't see things from end to end. I'm limited in my perspective. So I can't explain to you that, the, the incarnation. I can't explain to you how one God could be three people, the Trinity. And it's the same with this. I can't tell you how God can be in absolute control of everything and then you be responsible for what you do. But you know what? It's in the Bible. Passage after passage after passage after passage, it teaches that, and the both are the truth. They both are true. So, what I do with that is I acknowledge I'm not God. You are God. And I'm going to trust you. To me, that's the best course of action. Trust and obey. For there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust him and to obey him. His character is impeachable. Back in Genesis 18, Abraham said, Will not the God of all the earth do what's just? Will he not do what is right? He will. Whatever is right, when it's all said and done, he'll do it. So I don't fret about that stuff too much. I don't worry about it. I just look at the character of God. I know God's character. I know that he's perfectly good, gracious, kind, forgiving. He's no patsy. I know that he can be a stern disciplinarian. God can be severe. God can be not severe. He is who he is. And so I just look at him, and I worship, and I just trust him with those things. I can't tie him together. Nobody can tie him together. In the mind of God, however, they tie together perfectly. Philippians, it is known as an epistle of joy. 
And Ecclesiastes has been said to be the Philippians of the Old Testament. Knowing God, knowing his sovereignty, knowing that he is in absolute control of everything. For the Christian, that is a savor of life. For the guy that's not a Christian, that's terrifying. That's scary. But for the one that knows God, it's a joyful thing. I mean, just look at the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians. He's in prison. He don't have nothing, but he's got God and the hope of an eternity. And he's good with it. If he dies, that's fine. If he don't die, I'll stay around here and I'll help you to understand God better. That's kind of what I'll do, but I'm good. And so this book of Ecclesiastes is the Old Testament version of that book. And to know this God, to know his sovereignty, to know his absolute control over everything, for the Christian is tremendous joy. And that's why Solomon says in verse 12, I know there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all of his labor, it is the gift of God. And Solomon goes on to say in verse 14, I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it, and there is nothing to take from it. For God is so worked that men should fear him. You should fear this God that I'm telling you about. He's in your kitchen. He isn't a God just clear out here. He's right here. In your face. Working in your life in ways you don't even have a clue. You ought to respect that and fear him. So, he says, God, what he does, it'll be done. Justification, it isn't a, it's not a process. Justification, as we've been learning in the Ephesians study, it's not a process. It's all God, one side. God does it for his purposes, and he's the one that does it. And it's a one-time, instant thing. If you're saved, you're saved. And then, where we're at now is in Ephesians 4, you turn the corner, and because you understand these things, you, you act like the Apostle Paul. You live it out. And believe me, nobody understood Ephesians 1 through 3 better than the Apostle Paul. He knew he didn't do anything to save himself. He knew it. And he knew that Nothing he did could add to his salvation or add anything to that. He couldn't add nothing to that. But when he sat in the chair and he studied Ephesians 1 to 3 and he meditated on that and it began to dawn on him the vanity that he was rescued from, the empty heart that he once had but now no longer has, Look at his life. Look at it. Ephesians 4, chapter 1. I implore you, walk like this. Be humble. Be patient. Bear with each other in love. Do this because of that. Make that beautiful to the pagan out there. Make it so that they look at your life and no, you're not just another Joe off the street. You were saved. You adorn, according to Titus, the gospel. I beg you, he says, walk like that. Now, again, that is from a man that understands better than you and I ever will, Ephesians 1 to 3. He knows imputation. He knows justification isn't a process that God put the Holy Spirit into his heart sovereignly. He knows these things. And then look how passionate he lives. And I told the people in the Ephesians study, Calvinistic thinkers in history that have sat and known Ephesians 1 through 3 have been like that. Whitfield, read about him. George Whitfield, 
He understood this about as good as the Apostle Paul, and he was probably the second best missionary that ever lived other than the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, he was the best missionary that ever lived. And he understood these truths. He understood, I can't change nothing. God does. But man, I'm going to make it known with my life. I'm going to let people know all about these things. And so I guess what I'm trying to say to you, to say to you is, don't look at the Apostle Paul like the frozen chosen. And don't look at Whitfield like the frozen chosen. Those guys were real flesh and blood men, just like you. And they were passionate about this stuff. Which that's what the Holy Spirit does. If you got him living in you, you're going to get passionate about this stuff. And it's not going to be like I told the people in the Ephesians study. Um, let's read the doctrine. Take it or leave it. Could care less whether you believe it. That's not the Apostle Paul that I see in the scriptures. And that ain't a Whitfield that I read about in history. Whitfield, he had a guy sleeping in his congregation. <laughs> if I had come to you in the word of man, you could sleep. But since I come to you in the name of the living God, you better wake up. Get out of your stupor. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? Passionate about these things. They weren't indifferent. So, justification, that's what Solomon is saying. You can't change nothing God does. It's perfect. It's not a process, but you will live it out. He says, God has so worked these things that men should fear him. Verse 15, that which is has been already. So, you were chosen before the foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 6. We love God because he first loved us, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. That was already done. You just happened to come to know it in time. So that which is has already been, and that which will be, he says, has already been. The things in the future, they've already been. You were predestined to wherever you're going. You were predestined, if you're saved, to be there, to be before the throne of revelation, whatever, and be praising the king. And if you don't show up there, it wasn't anything on God's part. It wasn't because God didn't make his son known to you. It's because you just didn't want to be there. It's willful sin. You just chose your bed. You don't want to come. You got better things to do. You just don't want to come to Jesus Christ. You don't want to bow the knee to him. You don't want to give him the praise and the glory and the honor that, that God is seeking for him. And you deserve what you get if you don't show up there. So, that which will be has been. Paul in Ephesians says, I pray. I pray this for myself. I pray this for you. That the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you will know the hope of this calling. And that hope, like we've been learning, is not the world's hope so. I hope my team will win the ball game. Um, I hope I get this job. No, when the scriptures talk about hope, it's a, it's a done deal. This hope is a certain predestined outcome. It will happen. And that's what he's praying that you'll understand so that you'll get rid of this garbage in your life and start getting busy to your destiny, moving towards your destiny, which an omnipotent God will not allow to go south. People talk about the perseverance of the saints. What it really is, is the preservation of the saints. God is going to keep you if you belong to him. He's going to keep you. You're going to be there. There's nothing in all of creation that's going to change his, your position. 
Nothing that's going to change your love, his love for you. Nothing. You're going to get there. So our destiny is predetermined. God will finish what he started. And that's what the whole context of Romans 8.28 says. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he glorified. Done deal. You notice all those are in the past tense? And that which will be has already been. They're all in the past tense. So in closing, let me just read this poem. This is a rich poem by Cowper. God moves, he says, in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and he rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and he works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and they shall break in blessing on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and in time, he will make it plain. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do come before you and we do acknowledge your greatness. And Father, we, as we stand before that greatness, acknowledge our littleness, acknowledge our inability, Father, to just rightly think about you sometimes. And so it's for that reason, Father, that we thank you for your word. We thank you for the wisdom that breathed it out to tell us about this God that we would know nothing about unless it was revealed. And so, Father, we pray that as we go forth from here, that you would do a work that only you can do, that your Holy Spirit would transform hearts and manifest the truths of your word in those hearts so that we'd be different, that we would be glorifying and honoring and worthy to walk with your Son. And so, Father, we know that is our position by grace, you gave us that position, but that we need, to, we need to make our practice equal with that. And that's not nothing we can do. And so we just implore your grace to work in us, work in our hearts for your son's glory, for his honor. It's in his name we pray. Amen.